Back in Unger's store, Jackson had to wait for his horses to be reshod before he could resume marching. While he waited, Jackson decided to rid the army of officers that had not impressed him. On January 10th, he ordered General Meem to Moorefield with 545 militia and General Carson to Bath with 225 militia. Colonel A. Monroe, commanding the militia detachment at Kakapon Bridge, warns Jackson that the militia are so disturbed by news of the Union attack that he doesn't think he can hold them there in camp for much longer. Jackson began granting furloughs in accordance with the Bounty and Furlough Act. Jackson also furloughed Gillum indefinitely for his unimpressive performance, and Gillum returned to VMI. Jackson was displeased with Garnett and asked the War Department to promote Lieutenant Colonel Seth M. Barton of the 3rd Arkansas to Brigadier General and assign him to lead the Stonewall Brigade. The War Department ignored Jackson's request given a lack of any concrete reason why Garnett should be removed. In camp near Unger's store, Jackson's army was unwashed and filthy with lice. It's unknown just how many were diseased. Garnett's concern for his men kept losses from illness down in the Stonewall Brigade. Loring's troops, however, were twice as sick as Garnett's, and many of Loring's subordinate officers encouraged their men to abandon their posts. As this was going on, Lander asked McClellan for permission to advance into Virginia, but McClellan sternly declined. Instead, McClellan ordered Lander to go to Romney and lead the Union force back to the B&O Railroad. When Lander learned of this, he was livid. On the 9th, he arrived in Romney, and the next day, he and his force of 7,000 troops left for Patterson Creek Station on the B&O, six miles east of Cumberland. Neither the troops nor Lander, who was still nursing his leg wound, were happy about this. Lander cursed his officers and men as well as the weather. Crossing a swollen creek on the way north, several horses were swept downstream. Seeing this, Lander cursed, The next time I undertake to move an army, and God Almighty send such a rain, I will go around and cross hell on the ice. On the 11th, the Union force finally arrived at Patterson's Creek Station. The camp was extremely muddy after three days of rain. The 29th and 67th Ohio Infantry joined Lander's force in the mud. Much like the rebels at Unger's store, many of the Federal soldiers were exhausted and became sick in camp. On January 19th, Jackson learned that the Union had abandoned Romney. With the horses finally shod, the rebels started off again for the town. The Stonewall Brigade led the way, making nine miles that day and encamping near Slane's Crossroads. Wet snow and sleet continued to plague the troops and muddy roads impeded everyone. The following day, the Confederates arrived in Romney. The town had been depleted of anything useful by the retreating Federals. The Stonewall Brigade, the first to arrive in town, broke into churches, private homes, and the courthouse to find shelter. Once again, Loring's men were forced to camp in fields or stables. Jackson, frustrated over his inability to capture Hancock, planned an offensive to capture Cumberland. He believed there were 11,000 troops defending the city and requested another infantry brigade and a cavalry regiment from Richmond. Secretary Benjamin declined, saying that there were no more troops to give. Jackson decided to alter his plans. He proposed sending Garnett's and Tolliver's brigades to New Creek Station, modern-day Kaiser, West Virginia, to destroy the railroad bridges there. This would threaten Lander's communications west of Cumberland and his flank and rear. However, Jackson's men were enraged at him and demoralized. His army was now only at two-thirds strength, with furloughs and illness having depleted it. Due to complaints by his officers, Jackson canceled this offensive and decided to move his army to winter quarters. All in all, Jackson was pleased with the campaign results, boasting to Richmond that Morgan and most of Hampshire counties had been restored to the Confederacy. 
In reality, however, Jackson had done little to disrupt the Union. He decided to leave Loring's three brigades in Romney and return to Winchester himself with the Stonewall Brigade to guard against Banks. Jackson distributed Boggs' militia across the South Branch Valley to guard Romney as far south as Moorefield. He also left Loring with three companies of cavalry under Sheets. Carson's militia would remain at Bath, Meem's brigade would occupy Martinsburg, and Ashby's cavalry would patrol the Potomac. There was a serious problem with this plan, however. Romney was not a defensible position. The town could only be defended by securing Fort Mill Ridge, the ridge south of the South Branch overlooking the town, plus the hills and ravines east of Romney. Lieutenant Colonel Seth Barton, Jackson's chief engineer, estimated that the rebels would need 20,000 men to hold the town. Further, Lander was actually closer to Romney from Cumberland than Jackson would be from Winchester. Lander had 6,000 troops at Patterson's Creek, 1,500 troops at Green Springs, 3,000 at New Creek, and between two and 3,000 at Cumberland, for a total of about 13,000 in all. Loring was aware of this from spies and would have less than 5,000 troops himself at Romney. Regardless, Jackson was leaving. On January 23rd, the Stonewall Brigade left Romney. Loring's men were not happy about being left behind. The town itself was in shambles. Private Richard W. Waldrop recorded that, Romney looks very much as if it had been visited by an earthquake and pretty well shaken to pieces. The citizens, what few are here, don't seem to regret it much, and some of them say they hope the Yanks will burn it if they ever get here again. It was filthy indoors and outdoors. Raw sewage and mud covered the streets. Colonel Samuel V. Fulkerson, commander of the 37th Virginia Infantry, wrote to some Virginia congressmen to try to free Loring from Jackson's command. General Tolliver endorsed the letter. Tolliver wrote a letter on the 25th to Loring echoing Fulkerson and got six other regimental commanders to endorse it. Some, he asked, however, refused. Loring endorsed the petition and sent it to Secretary Benjamin. He also sent a copy to Jackson and one copy with Tolliver, who was going to Richmond on furlough to give to Jefferson Davis. Tolliver had mixed results. The Confederate Congress was not receptive, but President Davis wanted to hear more about the conditions of the army, admitting that Jackson had made a mistake, and ordered Benjamin to order Jackson to move Loring back to Winchester. On January 30th, Benjamin telegraphed these orders to Jackson. Jackson complied and subsequently resigned his command, writing the secretary, With such interference in my command, I cannot expect to be of much service in the field, and accordingly respectfully request to be ordered to report for duty to the superintendent of the Virginia Military Institute at Lexington. Should the application not be granted, I respectfully request that the President will accept my resignation from the Army. Jackson elaborated on these sentiments in letters to Governor Letcher and his friend Alexander Bottler, the Confederate Congressional Representative of the Valley District. Secretary Benjamin was shocked by Jackson's resignation. President Davis refused to accept it. Bottler appealed to Governor Letcher to try to reason with Jackson. The governor sent Bottler to Winchester with a written appeal for Jackson to reconsider. On February 6, Bottler arrived in Winchester and met with Jackson. The commanding general reiterated that he did not want Secretary Benjamin interfering in military movement. He also remarked that by abandoning Romney, the Union now had the Confederates bottled in the valley. Jackson said, when the spring campaign opens, the movement made in this direction will be on both flanks as well as from the front. They want this valley, and if the valley is lost, Virginia is lost. Bottler assured Jackson that the secretary would not interfere again and reminded him that the governor of his own state wants him to stay. Jackson agrees to leave the decision with Governor Letcher to decide. 
Lander, meanwhile, was still determined to cooperate with Banks on attacking Jackson. He had 9,330 infantrymen total, with 6,331 concentrated near Cumberland, and the rest spread out between the city and North Branch Bridge. He also had 1,114 cavalry. McClellan refused to authorize any attack on Winchester. To appease McClellan, Lander proposed moving on Romney instead while Banks distracted Jackson with a feint on Shepherdstown. McClellan agreed to this. However, heavy rains swelled the Potomac, preventing any immediate crossings. More accurate maps of the region reached Lander and revealed a route of attack on Romney previously unknown from the east. On February 3rd, Lander began the march by boarding his troops onto trains bound for French's store, Virginia, modern-day South Branch Depot, West Virginia. Just outside of Camp Kelly, a few miles from Cumberland, Lander collapsed with a sudden illness later revealed to be sepsis. The same day, Loring began withdrawing from Romney. On February 6, Colonel Nathan Kimball's brigade reoccupied Romney. Finding Loring gone, however, Lander pulled Kimball back to the Paw Paw Railroad Tunnel near modern-day Magnolia, West Virginia. The same day that Kimball arrived in Romney, Union engineers repaired the Big Cacapon Bridge. In Winchester, there was animosity between Loring's men, who have been bad-mouthing Jackson's performance, and the men of the Stonewall Brigade, who are still loyal to their commander. The men of the Stonewall Brigade blame Loring's complaints for causing Jackson to resign. Tensions boil over into fistfights between soldiers, and Loring's troops are, once again, relegated to the least desirable spots to set up camp around the city. There are also thousands of ill soldiers, with one doctor reporting over 1,100 hospitalized. After almost a week, on February 9th, Jefferson Davis promoted Loring to Major General and transferred him to Georgia. A week later, the 1st Tennessee and 1st Georgia Infantry Regiments were ordered to Tennessee, and the 7th and 14th Tennessee Infantry Regiments were reassigned to Johnston's command at Manassas. Jackson preferred that Loring be court-martialed for undermining his command, but Jefferson Davis declined. Furloughs further depleted Jackson's strength to only 6,404 troops in the whole valley in February. Banks, on the other hand, was increasing his strength from 18,000 to 23,000 during the same month. On the same day that Loring was promoted, Lander, seemingly recovered, resumed moving his forces from Patterson's Creek to the Paw Paw Tunnel. Jackson was fully aware of these movements and warned Joseph Johnston that he would need at least 9,000 men to hold the lower valley. On February 10th, Colonel Dunning set out from New Creek Station with 1,400 troops and Lander's permission to capture beef cattle in Moorfield. These cattle were being guarded by rebel militia. After a little skirmishing, the militia fled into the hills south of Moorfield. However, no cattle were found, having been driven away by the rebels sometime before the Federals arrived. However, the South Branch Valley was now effectively clear of rebels. Lander's illness returned and it became clear that he was going to die soon. He entered a delirious state, no longer concealing his opinions behind politeness. In a letter to U.S. Secretary of War Edwin M. Stanton, Lander wrote, General Williams is an ass. General Banks is a failure. With faith in God and the American Republic, I will beat the enemy forces with half their numbers. My enemy is your department, not in front. You will regard this as disrespectful. I hope you may. I am not here for promotion or emolument. Two days later, on the 12th, Lander decided to attack Sensen Divers militia at Bloomery Furnace modern-day Bloomery, West Virginia, and to lead the assault himself. Late on the 13th, Kimball's 1st Brigade, Lander, and two companies of cavalry set off for Bloomery Furnace. The roads were very muddy, and the Federal Column was forced to detour up Sidling Hill to the summit. 
Once there, Lander ordered the 76th Ohio and 13th Indiana Infantry Regiments back down the hill to seal Bloomery Gap from the west by dawn. The rest of the column descended the eastern slopes of Sidling Hill. When they reached the swollen Kakapon River, Lander was enraged to hear that the engineers could not bridge the waters. However, John Fuller, a wagon master of the 8th Ohio Infantry, proposed a solution. He forded one wagon at a time, filled with ballast, until the river was bridged. At 2.30 a.m. on the 14th, the task was complete and the Federal column resumed marching. By dawn, Lander was still two miles away from Bloomery Furnace. Federal cavalry arrived and Lander rode forward with them toward a cluster of buildings that they were certain housed militia officers. However, when they arrived, they discovered that Bloomery Furnace had been abandoned and that Sensendiver and his men had withdrawn two miles east. Lander ordered the cavalry to charge, but the commander, Colonel Henry Anasanso of the 1st Virginia Union Cavalry Regiment, only proceeded slowly a short distance, then stopped to await infantry support. There were only a few Confederate skirmishers in front, and Lander, enraged, took command of the cavalry personally and dashed forward at full gallop, ordering everyone else to follow him. The 31st Virginia Militia were guarding the gap ahead under Colonel Robert F. Baldwin. However, only five troopers had accompanied Lander in the charge. The rest, including Anasanso, had remained behind. Regardless, Lander charged in and bluffed Baldwin into believing that he had the militia surrounded. Baldwin surrendered, although other militiamen continued to resist, firing from behind cover. Finally, the 1st Ohio Cavalry marched past the 1st Virginia Union Cavalry and scattered the rebels. Lander helped to capture militiamen and fired a round at a Union Cavalryman who was shirking his duties. And Sansell finally rode in, advancing toward the 51st and 89th Virginia Militia further ahead, but suffered a fall and he and his regiment were forced back. Colonel Kimball pushed past them with the 14th Indiana and 7th Virginia Union Infantry Regiments to break the Confederate resistance. The 8th Ohio Infantry, led by Colonel Samuel A. Carroll, pursued the militia eight miles to Unger Station. The raid had netted 65 prisoners, including 17 officers. Lander's force returned to the Paw Paw Tunnel by midnight. Lander wired McClellan with the results, who was not particularly impressed. However, he did receive a letter of congratulations from Stanton, who informed him that President Lincoln had heard of his attack and was happy. Lander assured Stanton that he was ready to return to the field, but in reality his health was fading. As these relatively minor offenses went on, the Confederacy suffered major defeats in other theaters of war. In the West, Union forces captured Forts Henry and Donelson, and on the Atlantic shore they captured Roanoke Island. These victories netted the Union thousands of Confederate prisoners. Meanwhile, no European nation had recognized the Confederacy, and Johnston's army of 40,000 was now opposed by McClellan's enormous force of 155,500. In the face of all this, the Confederate Congress passed the Conscription Act to keep soldiers in the field. Jefferson Davis told Jackson that he had no reinforcements to send him. Hundreds of rebels began deserting in the valley. Most Union soldiers felt optimistic about the upcoming campaign season of 1862. However, McClellan did not share in the enthusiasm, instead believing that he was outnumbered. He began planning an amphibious campaign that would displace Johnston from Manassas. His idea was to take his army by sea and land at Urbana, Virginia and capture West Point, Virginia. 
This would force the Confederacy to abandon the York Peninsula. However, he did little to begin putting this into motion. President Lincoln had issued Special War Order No. 1, ordering him to march on Manassas by February 22nd. When McClellan told Lincoln about his Peninsular campaign, Lincoln decided to give it a chance. Banks, meanwhile, assured McClellan that he and Lander together could occupy Winchester and Leesburg by March 1st. McClellan finally acquiesced, authorizing Banks to cross the Potomac only far enough to reopen the B&O Railroad near Harper's Ferry. Lander was ordered to hold at Paw Paw Tunnel until Banks was across, then move east of Hancock to help repair the railroad from Hancock to Harper's Ferry. In late February, Banks began marching from Frederick to just behind Maryland Heights with J.J. Abercrombie's and Charles S. Hamilton's brigades. Banks left Alpheus Williams' brigade at Hancock. At Maryland Heights, poor planning and incompetence prevented the construction of proper pontoon bridges. McClellan had ordered pontoon sections constructed in Washington without checking that the dimensions could actually pass through the CNO canal locks. When boatmen tried to take the pontoon sections up the river, they found, to McClellan's humiliation, that they were too big to fit through the locks. On February 26th, a small makeshift bridge was built by the 3rd Wisconsin Infantry. Banks began crossing into Harper's Ferry. The town was largely abandoned and gutted. Hamilton occupied Bolivar Heights, while Abercrombie occupied Loudoun Heights. The next day, McClellan learned about the pontoon fiasco. Back at Maryland Heights, the makeshift bridge was rocked by high waters. Supply wagons were unable to cross and left the troops in Harper's Ferry without any baggage or supplies. All these problems combined made McClellan give up on any thought of advancing on Winchester. He settled on focusing on rebuilding the bridges and reopening the railroad and turned his attention to more important sectors in the theater of war. On February 28th, McClellan accompanied a reconnaissance to Charlestown and ordered Lander and Williams to cross at Williamsport and occupy Martinsburg. Jackson, meanwhile, was aware of these Union movements and was happy to see them. He looked forward to waging war, even though the Federals outnumbered him six to one. Jackson withdrew from Martinsburg without a fight and began preparing to leave Winchester for the South. Many civilians also fled the city. A pro-Union diarist named Julia Chase wrote that, the Virginians have always said never surrender, that they never ran. Pretty good numbers are running now fast enough. Back in Charlestown, federal soldiers marched in and began occupying the settlement. Many civilians were afraid that the Federals would raise the town given its reputation as being the site of John Brown's hanging. Cozens writes an account of the Reverend of the Presbyterian Church as follows. Hurrying through the downpour to check on his Presbyterian church, the Reverend W. B. Dutton braced himself for the worst. Strother fell in with him, and together they found the sanctuary overrun with soldiers from the 3rd Wisconsin, some of whom were rolling up carpets. Dutton implored Strother and the regimental commander, Colonel Thomas H. Ruger, to spare the pulpit, Bibles, and candelabras. Glancing toward the organ, Dutton saw a platoon of rugged-looking fellows fumbling with the music books of the choir. He looked in agony at the prospective destruction and desecration, recalled Strother. A moment after, the books were all open, and fifty accordant voices rose in a thrilling anthem that filled the church with solemn music. The alarmed clergyman paused a moment. His face became calm and solemn. He turned to the officer in command. You need not move the furniture from the pulpit, sir. It will be safe, I feel assured. 
Other officers marched through the town singing John Brown's body while a few others raided the town of food and commodities. Slaves helped soldiers locate stores that their masters had hidden away, and many fled to freedom. Although these raids took place, there were no acts of destruction. On March 2nd, Martinsburg fell to Williams' brigade, who had set out from Hancock two days earlier. His troops were under-equipped, and many were barefoot. The town had already been gutted of supplies by the departing Virginia militia. Martinsburg had many pro-Union families. Some Union soldiers were gracious to their citizen hosts, while others ransacked property. On the same day that Martinsburg fell, Lander died. He had been preparing to go on campaign again, but fell gravely ill. Kimball took command in his absence. As the rebels began evacuating Winchester, Jackson planned his next move. If he withdrew, he could go through the Page Valley or down the Valley Pike. In any case, his objective is Mount Jackson, where he has set up a supply depot. Meanwhile, Johnston has learned of the amphibious campaign that McClellan is planning and withdraws from Centerville to Culpeper Courthouse. On March 3rd, Jackson wrote Johnston that he is prepared to fall back as far as Newmarket. The same day, intelligence and spy reports assured Banks that Jackson only had 5,000 men at Winchester. On March 6th, rebels found Ashby's pickets asleep on the Charlestown Road. They had not been reporting federal troop movements. Jackson ordered Ashby to give daily reports at a minimum. The next day, General Williams began advancing up the Valley Pike from Bunker Hill with a cavalry reconnaissance. Seven miles north of Winchester, two Union cavalry companies began skirmishing with one of Ashby's poorly equipped cavalry companies. Ashby lost six killed and seven wounded and was thrown back. The following day, March 8th, there were growing indications that Jackson was preparing to withdraw. Banks asked McClellan for explicit permission to march on Winchester. McClellan was evasive, but ordered Banks to find out if any of Johnson's army was moving to the city. Banks decided to continue the advance. Meanwhile, Jackson was not completely committed to abandoning Winchester. He wired Johnston, telling him that he wants to stand and fight, but acknowledges Johnston's request that all Confederate armies withdraw in unison, Johnston from Northern Virginia and D.H. Hill from Leesburg. On March 10th, Brigadier General Willis A. Gorman's brigade from John Sedgwick's division and Abercrombie's brigade from Banks's division arrive at Berryville, 10 miles east of Winchester. At this point, Jackson was facing Hamilton's brigade at Smithfield, modern-day Middleway, West Virginia, Williams's brigade at Bunker Hill, Virginia, Kimball's and Colonel Jeremiah Sullivan's brigades at Martinsburg, and Erastus B. Tyler's brigade at Back Creek Railroad Depot, nine and a half miles west of Williamsport. Altogether, this was 30,000 federal troops within one day's march of Winchester. Against this, Jackson had less than 5,000 Confederates. The following day, March 11th, Banks ordered Hamilton to conduct a reconnaissance toward Winchester with his brigade plus Williams's, Kimball's, and Sullivan's. Brigadier General James Shields, the same man that had nearly fought a duel with Abraham Lincoln many years earlier, arrived to take command of Lander's division. Tyler's brigade arrived in Martinsburg and Shields joined them. Hamilton, the ranking officer of the four brigades chosen to advance on Winchester, begins moving up the Valley Pike, skirmishing with Ashby the entire day. Williams's brigade leads the advance and encamps at Stevenson's Depot, 
modern day Stevenson, Virginia, for the night. Although Banks had only authorized a reconnaissance, the four brigade commanders meet and all agree to stage an assault on the city the next day. The Stonewall Brigade and Colonel Jesse Burks's brigade, formerly Gillum's, were stationed north of the city behind earthworks while Tolliver's brigade was east-northeast of the city on the Berryville Road. Jackson wanted the men to slip away from the earthworks undetected draw rations for the night and rest, then return to attack before dawn. Unfortunately for Jackson, at a council of war he called that evening, his subordinate commanders rejected that plan. This, plus a screw-up that had sent ration wagons too far south and the troops after them, spoiled any chance that they would be fed and rested for an attack. Jackson, angry, finally, reluctantly, decided to evacuate. He issues the orders just after midnight on March 12th, and the rebels begin slipping away to the south. As Jackson rides off away from Winchester, he vows never to call another council of war again. If you enjoyed that, please like and subscribe. And of course, if you feel like it, uh, I do have a PayPal account that you can donate to. Links in the description. In the next part, we'll see Jackson's withdrawal from Winchester and then his return.